Uh, good, good morning, folks. Uh, my name is Anadi Mishra. I lead uh, the architecture group at MOSIP. MOSIP, as the name says, is a... Uh, all right. Thank you, thank you. So MOSIP uh, stands for uh, Modular Open Source Identity Platform. It's, it's actually a lot more than that, but uh, we were running out of acronyms. Uh, <clears throat> identity platform specifically in terms of uh, government as a service. So if you were to think in terms of government as a stack of computers delivering some service to people that it serves, um, the foundational layer would be the INT platform of that. And uh, uh, in our experience, uh, we, we found that the I not having identity is a, is a big developmental roadblock, uh, especially in uh, sub-Saharan Africa, some parts of Latin America, uh, even uh, Asia Pacific and Eastern Europe. And uh, so taking that into account, uh, this, this project was funded and then eventually for the last little less than two years we've been working on it. Uh, very quickly, the structure of this talk, uh, I lead the architecture group. Uh, I'm here with my colleague, uh, Sasi. He is the security architect. And uh, this 40, 45 minute talk, we want to spend about 10 minutes quickly going through what are the use cases, what is the overall architecture. And then Sasi will kind of drill down into what security and privacy features are there. Uh, that's going to be more in-depth talk, I'm doing more on the skipping on the surface. So our vision is inclusivity, protecting privacy and user rights, availability to public services and governance for every resident of a country. And uh, we want to provide this as a open source platform to countries to come and pick it up. The, the big problem that we felt was that uh, it's not that these technologies are not commercially available, they are. Uh, in, in closed source formats, such technologies are available, they are highly protected. Uh, the biggest problem we have felt is that governments get logged in when they, when they buy into one such platform and like any commercial service provider, these companies have an inherent interest in keeping the governments logged in. So then it becomes problematic for them to uh, switch technologies or switch the platform later on if one platform is not working out. So that was felt to be a big need for, uh, to have a project like MOSIP in place. The key features, it's actually a very simple system. There are fundamentally four major modules. The first one is the pre-registration system, which is actually a simple scheduling website where you can go take an appointment and, and move on to uh, Once you get an appointment, you go to enrollment center, go present whatever documents you have, get, uh, if biometric authentication is needed, uh, get enrollment into that service. And eventually, once uh, the deduplication de happens, you can then move on to start using that identity. It's not a card, it's a number. And uh, because it's biometrically uh, connected to, the record is connected to that number, um, you could, uh, without any collateral on your body, you could still authenticate yourself. Uh, the architecture principles, like I said, we want to avoid vendor lock-in. We want to over use open standards. The other thing that we felt about this kind of a platform was that uh, uh, if a country or a society is going to use it, this a system like this is going to run for a few centuries. It's not something that we build in a regular commercial space where, uh, you know, the, the horizon of the system is for maybe 10 years, 15 years, and after that, you think about building a new system. The system has to kind of, it has generational impact. Maybe 200 years down the road, while we are all gone, this system might still be running. Might, and which is another reason why it is open standards and open source. Uh, because we want uh, more smarter people than us to come later on and kind of, you know, put in and make the system better at a later date. Manage it generationally. 
Uh, we also want uh, the countries, since they are sovereign, uh, we want them to, to, to be managing it themselves. Uh, horizontal scalability is important. Just like we don't want uh, vendor lock-in in software, we don't want vendor lock-in in hardware either. We don't. So it's designed to be run on top of uh, simply available commodity hardware commodity. Data privacy, we'll talk about. The platform-based approach is important. It's an API-first approach. We, 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 we leave a lot of room for other ecosystem players to come in. The one thing that we guard with our lives in this project is the API signatures. That we don't want to mutate. Other than that, a lot of thought has gone into how these APIs should be. Um, it's all there out. And in fact, another reason why I'm talking to you here is I'm, we are looking for people to come and join us. Uh, please look at our project at github slash mosip. Uh, it's all there. A um, lot more details. Other than API approach, uh, stuff that matters to us is the, the, the manageability of uh, the stack. Uh, we want the countries to run their own stack, manage it themselves, things like sharding, uh, things like uh, auditability, etc., the scale. All that we want, want these countries to be to create local capacity and manage it themselves. We don't want to be doing it for them. <clears throat> Architecture principles, again, mostly these are very well-known principles. I-18 and internationalization, loosely coupled, fault tolerance is, 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 is built into the system. Uh, a lot of extensibility for subsystems because we are API driven. And the APIs are also rather uh, metadata based structure. So, they can mutate with time and, and, and newer front ends, newer libraries could come. The four major parts, the pre-enrollment, enrollment, enrollment processor. Enrollment processor is by, by far the largest piece of code. This is where the deduplication happens. Uh, unique identity is created. Uh, over the last 10 years, we also realized that biometrics is, it makes sense to use biometric only for deduplication. Uh, and then not use it or lock it away and, and use uh, your cell phones or, you know, authentication principles of what you know and what you have. Like a cell phone is only something that you have and you can use it as an OTP. And MOSIP, uh, MOSIP supports that massively. Uh, ID authentication comes in two flavors. First is a yes-no authentication, which, is, which, which mostly in devices uh, that are enabled by this API have a red or a green light for, for something as simple as public distribution system or distributing food or even uh, you know, in, in refugee crisis areas where uh, uh, just food or some uh, clothing is being distributed. Uh, you will just get a yes no answer whether uh, when, a, when a person authenticates and uh, ekyc is slightly more nuanced ekyc stands for uh, well it's kyc electronic kyc stands for know your customer these are uh, uh, these are laws that are put forward by regulatory bodies in a, in, in a society like in india you might have tri or banking regulator which will say that, oh, if, if you need to open a bank account, you must have some proof of address and proof of identity. MOSIP is designed to give that identity to people. And number two, uh, the EKYC infrastructure allows banks to seamlessly operate and uh, get the authenticated data from the server. There's, there's a big chunk of uh, security and privacy infrastructure that we have layered over the EKYC service. We'll talk about that in a bit. The logical architecture is a rather involved diagram, but fundamentally the four modules, uh, the things to understand are the kernel layer at the bottom where we have some demographic data, some biometric data, which is all kept in, 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 in a uh, cryptographically signed environment. Um, there are audit logs in security. Everything is auditable inside the system. You can and, and you can choose to audit even what, who viewed what, not just what elemental data changes happened. The kernel is is a bunch of common services which uh, which are used to provide uh, 
services across the modules. Uh, in, in that sense, it is a foundational layer of this foundational ID system. And then of course, we have the core identity components, the identity administration, etc. And finally, the four elements that you see at the at the top, the, the four services that are most visible to the residents of a, of, a, of, a, of a place or a country or society where such a system is used. Enrollment processor itself is a, is a staged event driven architecture, it is a big batch system, it is designed for throughput and again um, to run on uh, using Docker and Kubernetes we have made it run on commodity hardware. There is the enrollment client log logical architecture. We, the, the, the highlight in this spe specific space is how not to let the biometric get compromised while the enrollment is happening. To that end, we are working towards uh, L1 devices. You will probably come across these terms very soon because they are coming to India too. Um, in an L1 device, the device makes a handshake with the MOSIP server directly and the image that it signs and encrypts can only be decrypted by the uh, enrollment server. I am going to now pass on the baton to my uh, security architect, uh, Sasi, uh, um, Sus and, and in, in, in view of the large space, technical space that we are covering in the shortest time, uh, uh, questions are okay, right? Please feel free to ask questions. Uh, good morning, everyone. So, <coughs> I have a bad throat, so let's see how we can speak. Um, so, um, it's a very, very young, young project. We are trying to get to um, most of the countries where you can't identify people or people are moving away from one town to the other town as nomads. Uh, you, you're trying to put an ID, foundational ID system for them. You're going to tell them that, hey, look, uh, from future for all the government services or any services that you think um, uh, the government is going to offer, you could prove yourself using uh, a mechanism that we could we, we, we would provide you with, right? Uh, so you, you're dealt with a series of challenges. Uh, the first challenge is about digital education itself is a big challenge. Uh, people are not used to digital education. Uh, people don't know how to protect these IDs. Uh, so the, that foundation itself is a, is a little weaker out there, right? Um, and then we have Upon that, we have collected biometrics. We are collecting quite a lot of information. Um, when I say quite a lot, it, it's, it's not too much. We, we, we are proposing to collect biometric and mostly demographic, and it's, it's up to the countries to decide how they collect. So it's, it's very important for us to lay these foundations um, in place in the, in the right blocks uh, so that the countries which are adapting it are not making repeatedly the same mistakes. The whole idea of bringing this open standards and openness to all of it is uh, let's learn together, let's make things better and efficient uh, as we move forward. And each country is different, each problems are unique, so we want to adapt it. So whatever learnings we have had over a time, uh, whether it's country like India, whether it's country like, um, I mean, continent like Africa, wherever we traveled across, uh, we kind of collected quite a lot of information about what's happening, how things could possibly work. Um, and what you see here is, is a combination of um, all of that uh, in place. So the first important principle, Security cannot come in the hindrance of any work. We want to be inclusive and 100% inclusive as much as possible, okay? Not at the cost of data compromise, that's not what I meant. Uh, but uh, we need to rethink if there is going to be a data compromise, but think it in the form of inclusive, it is a must. There is no, no way we could go back. Security has to work around it, right? Uh, one is upon custodians, we need to keep pushing this. this that's a gamble. Uh, we're going to keep pushing that across. Uh, in both the sides, between the government and us uh, together working. Um, at at MOSEP, you, you, you would see that every single code, every single uh, Docker that runs, uh, every single device that we interact with, there's a trust layer built in. Um, at this point in time, it's heavily relies on PKI, uh, but we are also thinking of moving to various other technologies which could also help us cryptographically to uh, prove the trust a lot more uh, efficiently. Um, and the uh, other part is about transparent. We also want to make uh, the governments uh, are the adapters. I'm, I mean, it's, it's not just for the government, Com even companies, corporates could adapt it. Uh, but um, we want the data to be a lot more transparent. What are you doing with the data? Uh, what's happening with our data? We want it to be transparently available so that the end resident and the civil activations could actually monitor and actually make decisions on what their government is doing with their data. Right? Uh, we are uh, working with Alan Turing uh, in UK to uh, Alan Turing University. 
uh, on the transparency part uh, to build in layers of transparency and other stuff in place um, in here. Okay. Um, uh, from the privacy side, uh, we also want to be uh, sure that uh, we, we want to make sure you could be anonymous until unless um, obviously the legal frameworks allows you to be uh, detectable at a certain layer. But we want to make you, uh, as much as uh, technology allows today, uh, we want to make you anonymous. Uh, in a way today you make a cash transaction, you are, you are making the transaction in all honesty, but you are anonymous to the government. So there is no central authority who could sit there and monitor uh, what you're doing. So we want to be uh, moving down that direction. So it, it, it is essential that we, we keep that as an objective in our privacy in, in place, right? Um, and the next important aspect is we are, we are going to prove something, right? Uh, and the pro uh, proving yourself is for a particular service. We want to make sure uh, there is a purpose limitation of what you're trying to prove. So you're trying to prove something uh, for a certain service to be availed. Uh, we want to limit that to that service and not take it forward for anything else. That cannot be a concern that you provided for something else. So we want to be putting that into the architecture um, in, in a way that you cannot debate about it in future and it has to be part of it. Okay. Uh, the next is uh, about data minimization. Uh, as Anadi was explaining, you would have seen there are two services already available, um, the authen authentication and the KYC. Authentication is just an SRNO. You give the information, you prove who you are, I would tell you you're, you're right, you're wrong. That's potentially all you get back. Uh, EKYC is little more, but even inside EKYC, there's quite a lot of layers built in. It's not just plain give out data. It's, it's specifically you as a user and the regulatory uh, bodies in the country together could decide what information actually can be given to what entity and to whom, right? And, and that kind of combines with the purpose uh, limitation. And then you also want to have a strong legal framework which kind of protects this, okay? Uh, while we could not make the legal frameworks ourselves, but we could put in enough technology background that when your country's legal frameworks or whichever country which is adapting goes in, uh, goes in they potentially have this uh, digital technology in place which could let them leapfrog that wrong things that we have been doing in a non-digital world. And that we want to be uh, very clear. So we want to be fair, we want to be transparent, um, and we want to be auditable um, and questionable in all nature. And, and that's the way we evolve, right? So these are the main, main high level objectives of how we think uh, we build every single piece of code, the design, uh, and look at things and, and ask questions and um, uh, derive things, okay? Um, as I said, the, the, the challenges are, 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 are huge. Um, most of it is not technology challenge itself because technology has like really, really leapfrogged uh, for building such kind of systems, right? Uh, but the biggest challenge is about uh, the education, uh, people not aware of digital technologies, people not aware of using the identity in a way uh, which is very constrained to this, right? Uh, because it's okay for you to share some information with your neighbor in a non-digital world and, and it's not going to go widespread. But putting the same information on a Facebook is going to be like extremely dangerous that it's widespread and the attacks could be large, large more. So the attack surface is larger in a digital related technology. So we want to be very, very clear on what we are trying to do and how we educate and uh, how we bring up people. And, and just relying on educating and awareness of people alone is not going to solve. So today technology provides a lot of ways where even if people are not really doing the right thing, we could actually push them into the, in, in that direction that they could do the right thing uh, without changing much of their behaviors because changing too much of behavior is not going to be culturally uh, workable in any nature, right? So there are a lot of interesting layers that are built in. It, it's a very young project. It's, it's, it's a one year old right now. Um, we, we anticipate to make a lot more changes to the project and it's, it's an active working happening around. Um, and interestingly enough, there are countries that are starting to adapt uh, right away. Um, and the adaptions are going on live at, as we speak uh, in various countries in, in, in Asia uh, and Africa. Okay? Um, I'm, I'm not going too deeper into these things. In, in, anything that you find that you want me to little deeper, um, we, we could go all the way till the code, but uh, it's, it's all open source. But uh, I, I, I'm also available full day, so you, you could re reach out. Okay? Um, whenever we speak about identity, the, the first and biggest hit that you would see is identity theft. And, and that too, when you create a digital platform, I think there are a lot, a lot of quite to people who are paranoid about uh, identity theft so for the right reasons. We, we have seen that uh, to be the biggest problem in the last decade. Uh, even in developed nations, these things could take over life for quite some time for people and, and you have no way to recover from the attack, 
right? Um, as a technology, we could put in a lot of things to protect, uh, but all of us know um, if you are a security practitioner, you, you know at some point in time somebody is going to get out and, and really find out some stupid things that you have done and actually take out and publish this information. Right? Whether you have encrypted it, whether you are highly protective about it, uh, some silly mistakes would happen which would end up uh, leaking out information and, and we all know about this, right? Uh, so it's nothing new, we, we expect uh, things could go wrong, but it's, it's, it's not that we voluntarily give up, right? Um, that's, that's why it's all open standards and, and fairness to everything. We, we are also giving out the code, uh, but the most other important thing is how do we come back from an identity theft, right? Today the biggest problem that everybody faces is you have no way to recover back and prove back 100% over a digital mechanism that, hey, you know what, it's not that guy, it's, it's me again. And then I could change and alter my, my things so that the other person cannot take over anymore my accounts and my, my, my data and other stuff. So recovery is a big, big thing that we could potentially do and that's by design. We want to bring it in and that's the uh, most important fact. And the other important fact is about proliferation, right? Uh, once you start giving out digital information across various people, how are you going to get this information and, and if, can somebody sit there and look at all this information that's available across his company and then see, hey, uh, this resident has bought this service, this service, but has not bought this service, maybe I should go and push him to buy the service. We, we don't want to be in that state where you could use our platform or our identities to actually uh, do those kind of proliferations and we want to be avoiding that, whether it's government doing it, whether it's private entities doing it, I, I think relatively we don't care, we don't want that to happen. Um, right? Um, with all said and done, it, it, the code is in the open source, you could fork it and make changes, so don't, don't go down there. That's not the uh, aim, but the aim is uh, doing the right thing, right? Um, and putting the right message in the for, uh, forward block and, and making sure that we move far ahead than from anybody else who thinks uh, other way around in, 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 in breaking the system. Um, that's, that's the entire uh, gamble that we make, right? And increase sophistication. When, when I say increasing sophistication, um, the attacks are getting better and better, uh, state governed, um, money driven, um, attacks would get better and, and we want to keep going that. It's, it's a catch up game and, and we never have to uh, sit there and wait for things to uh, evolve. And, and interestingly, the architecture of uh, MOSEP allows you to evolve it to a greater extent. If, if you look at um, the entire deployment, I think we, we have not shown you a lot of information, but uh, it's all Kubernetes driven. Um, every single component is versioned, every single IPAs are versioned. They potentially can interoperate and, and they know each other where they want to interoperate and other stuff. Okay. Um, now, um, some of the treatments, the, some, some of the way we want to treat the data in here. Um, you would you, see here, um, any personally identifiable information, we want to treat it extremely careful, extremely sensitive information. Uh, we, uh, as, as I said, it, it's encrypted to the core, but it is encrypted in a certain specific way, wherein only when you give out your certain identity mechanism, it can actually be decryptable. So let's assume there's a huge blob of information out there in one place in the hard disk. If you're going to pick it up and you want to encrypt it, uh, or sorry, you want to decrypt that information, um, it's not going to be easy until you know which user's data you want to decrypt and what's the identity that he holds at that point in time. Okay, it's, it's, it's a very important information. Uh, the way the cryptography has been structured in there um, is a very interesting way. And uh, obviously there are a lot of designs that you could follow. One of the designs is what followed here and, and we are also looking at various other designs uh, working with Alan Turing and other, um, other universities uh, across the globe. Um, so the, the design is a mass scale attack is going to be really, really tough for anybody to break in until probably a quantum computer comes in and breaks it out. Um, we may be 10 to 20 years ahead of it uh, or maybe 5 years ahead of it, we don't know. But we will prepare for that as well in the next years to come. But uh, the structure of the cryptography is very unique, uh, puts in user at the center of the entire cryptography layer rather than government at the center. So as I said in the beginning, um, hey, yeah, sure. Wonder. I think it's, by the way, it's very good that you are uh, thinking about all of these aspects. I am very encouraged uh, about that. One question I have is that I have many colleagues and I myself also work on security. Okay. We have many, many ideas using, for example, attribute based encryption, um, uh, multi party protocols, uh, you know, secure hardware. I can think about many, many ways by which one can improve this. Not all of them, you know, as the uh, eagerness as technologists, some of them may not actually be ready also. 
how can we have that conversation with you? We have a lot of expertise in things like that. So we, we, we are here yeah. all day and, and we are pretty open in Bangalore. Yeah. So uh, I don't know where you are from. But, but Sridham heads Microsoft Research in India. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, okay. <laughs> uh, okay. I, I think I looked at your video anyway. <laughs> anyway. I think, I think, yesterday, so yeah, I think there is a lot of synergy that we could bring in. Um, I'm, I'm sure. And, and one of your protocols which we want to actually adapt is uh, the homomorphic en encryption as well. We want to get there for our offline uh, kind of a models that we are looking at for anonymous uh, um, authentication layers. Uh, but yeah, I think there are, there are a lot of good work that I, I did see there. Uh, we could collaborate. I think today we could catch up for some time if, if you think it works out. Um, and then over digital mechanisms, whatever way is necessary, we'll catch up and we'll continue working and, 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 and we would prefer. Um, I mean, as long as it's open standards, um, it's, it's not proprietary. I think that's going to be a very interesting conversation to have. Uh, and we are, we are very open with that and, and excited as well. If, you, if you're going to tell us, there's a lot of interesting things that we could do. Okay. Um, Okay, um, and um, as I said, see, uh, take take a country like um, uh, a continent like Africa and others, right? Um, they, they're going to experience this in, in the first hand, and we don't want to leave them for like ten years or twenty years and and learn all of these mistakes that we have done repeatedly. Uh, whether it's India which which has done the mistakes, whether it's it's the U.S., the Europeans, or, or whoever it is, it, it doesn't matter. There are quite a lot of learnings that. Uh, has come out out of foundational identity systems that every country has built, learned, failed, or success, right? We want to take those experiences. And, and um, Anadi here has literally traveled so many places around uh, to speak and get more information, and, and then these things are constructed. And as I said, it, it, we, we are learning and we are, we are evolving uh, pretty fast. But whatever we have learned, we don't want to give it away. We, we want to put that into the exact code that could actually break that and move that ahead. Right? And that's what is uh, potentially what you see in um, every piece of writing that you'll, you'll see from us um, in, in here. Uh, some of the um, designs that we could go over. Sure, Satya. Derived from uh, user provided data, but then in the next bullet you have uh, the application handles encryption and decryption. So the application has the keys? Okay, no. When the user provides a specific attribute of himself, yes. uh, the key gets derived after that. Until then, the attribute is provided to you, you, do, you have no mechanism to derive it. Uh, when, when you say the application handles encryption, because lo there are a lot of questions about uh, transparent data, what, what, um, um, a physical box or something which is right in between, which is doing the encryption between the application and stuff. So what we were trying, uh, trying to put that is, uh, no, we, we trust the code. We're putting everything in open. So we want that specific code that we have put is actually doing an attribute-based encryption and decryption based on user providing that information to us. And if the user has not provided that information, that key deriving uh, is, a, is a huge humongous task. Any value to the system directly, avail directly available for you. Okay. That's fundamentally what that meant. Yeah, phenomenal work. Just wanted to check. So part of it is also authentication for the user subsequently? Uh, yes. Um, one is about enrollment itself, right? Uh, providing an identity, uh, an ID. The other is about uh, authenticating the person. Um, we also have a lot of different thoughts about the authentication itself. A um, lot of places where I advocate, at least personally, um, as part of Mosip and others, we, we keep telling the governments that, look, issuing an identity is your problem. Authentication is not your problem. Stop doing that. Just move away to uh, different players to do that. Bring in, bring in companies to do it. Bring in your own organizations uh, within you to play that gamble. Let the residents choose whom they, with whom they want to authenticate. Let's federate that entire model out. And, and that's, that's a very initial discussion. And, and no, that's no, how The uh, reason I was asking is you also mentioned revocations. Yes. So all three together starts getting very challenging from the deployment perspective. It is. We will it, take it offline if needed. Yeah. Yeah. It, it is a challenging in, in, in environment. It, it is a complex deployment. Uh, I don't think we, 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 it, it's going to be easy um, that somebody could just come in and start deploying and work our solutions. Uh, it is complex, absolutely. Um, it's not, it's, um, it, at a scale, if you look at it, a country takes two to three years to build a foundational ID system and go live. Um, we are still taking a year, approximately, approximately. Okay. We could be more, and, and, and those works are going on as, as we Also, I, you have to see it in terms of a product management challenge also. 
So the countries that we are talking to, most of these countries, they are, uh, they are approaching the entire subject matter with a lot of repetition. And it's a small part of the government that says, okay, we will play with a little part of it first, run a small pilot, but eventually we want to get there. No, even India, see, the moment we are getting to authentication opening up, uh, for example, the, I'm with IDRBT, the cooperative banks, those who do not have the muscle power. Hmm. Anyway, I would like to take it offline. Let us yeah, not. We'll, we'll, let's, let's talk. Let's talk. Let's talk. Let's try. Take it offline. Um, I'm sorry. Okay. Um, so, these are some of the uh, highlighted designs. Was, is, is what I would say. Right. Uh, you and you, everybody would know already. Right. In, at least from India and, and anywhere abroad, you you would already know what it means. Uh, it's a unique identifier. Uh, identifies you. But what what is different in MoSEP in this is. You can't use a UIN and authenticate in our solution. You, you, you can't avoid service with the ID, ID that I gave you as saying that that's a permanent ID because we want to push you down the path where you actually have revocable IDs and you use them to authenticate and not use a single one identity for your lifetime to actually authenticate. That ID is given for you to enable government to provide you with services and that ID is fundamentally used for you calling up government and telling that, hey, I want to address, uh, I want to change an address, I want to change a biometric, I want to change my update of biometric information, I want to give a better photograph of myself. Um, there, are, there are some services where the, the UIN is reserved for in all other places, okay. Uh, what we are trying to push down is don't use them. Create multiple other revocable IDs which a person could own it at a point in time, right and destroy it in a point in time. So we, we have a unique multiple ways of destroying it. Uh, you could create a virtual ID, you could destroy it after a first transaction that happens over that virtual ID. So if the first transaction happens, it will expire. You could tell that, hey, every day morning you could wake up and tell that I need a virtual ID today, I'll, I'll go in and use this ID for today. You could absolutely do that. You, I mean, there's like tons of mechanisms and policies that are built in which allows you to do and lets the governments to push down, okay. It's all about us making that enabled as a part of the technology so that when the government and the activism actually works together, they find the right middle path for that particular country to adapt, okay. Um, uh, the token IDs, token IDs are another unique mechanisms. Um, quite often our information that comes back from us is pretty random um, associated. You can't take two associated information, the response that we gave back and tell that is this for the same person. You can't match that. Uh, but in token IDs case, you could. Um, there are cases where the government wants to provide services um, or maybe do a direct benefit transfer to an uh, end user. So they want to make sure, I have, have I already transferred it to them or not? And if they want to validate that information, they need the ID. And we don't want to give them even the virtual ID in spite of it. We don't want to give that to them. Rather, we actually tokenize information and we provide those tokens in those specific cases. Again, that is policy driven in our system. Uh, so uh, that, that kind of leads to the path where um, if you are doing it for a specific purpose, that token is valid for that specific purpose. For a different pur purpose, a different organization doing it, the tokens won't look same even for the same person. So even if you take it at two services levels and you want to find out, has he availed this service as well as this service, you cannot find it within the system. It, it has to be um, out of it. So it kind of avoids a lot of uh, proliferation that we think uh, is happening. I mean, uh, you can't sit there and watch over how, how your residents are doing. That's not right. You can watch over when you, when you find a resident not doing the right thing. You think he is offending a lot of law and, and the regulations. Then probably you can specifically pick up that guy and then actually do what, what you want to do. But until then you could not do anything within the system. Okay. And, yeah. What, what kind of governance mechanism exists to allow for linkability of these token IDs and virtual IDs back to an ID? Is that, um, is that regulatory or is that, is that outside scope of it's the? It's outside the scope of okay. uh, regulation. But what we have done technologically is uh, given a cryptography token back uh, that in case uh, if you want ever to uh, identify back a specific individual. Uh, then you can give that individual's ID again, it's uh, attribute based. So you, you kind of got that guy, he is in the prison, judge wants it, wants this information and is, is giving out that information and asking, can you, value, can you prove now, right? You have all other evidence to prove, now you want to prove this, finally. 
you could pick up this attribute and then pass it on to the system to recover back uh, to find out is he, is he the same person who did this. Uh, you could do that. Uh, other way, there is no other mechanism at this point in time. Okay. It's a cryptography token. It's not, uh, um, even though we call this random, it's, it's not really uh, uh, extremely random enough. It, it is derived out of, again, attribute of the user back. I, I call it random because it's, it's easier for me to describe that. But as I say, you want to go deeper, I'm, I'm willing to go as far as the code is. It is linkable, uh, but you you can't link it until we, we and the user both coordinate to you. So which means we, and when I say we, the system, and the user giving his attribute. So if, if you don't know the user's attribute, you still can't figure it out. So hacking our information out, so let's assume our database is hacked and put out, until you have the information about the user, you can't still break it. Um, that doesn't mean we, we are very, very good, okay? Um, it, it is just the nature of the beast. Okay, um, quick time check, okay, I have some more time. So uh, these are the, uh, the foundational principles. Um, when I say foundational principles, um, you, you saw the objectives out there, right? The objectives literally govern us to tell what, what we want to do. Uh, the foundation principles are mostly for contributors, developers, or architects to make sure you are not moving away from the path that we have already defined uh, things in place, right? Um, so data, <coughs> everything within our environment we want to be digitally signed. Um, our dockers are signed, our uh, jar files are signed, um, our um, information that we release out is signed. Um, every, every Kubernetes cluster, every part in our clusters kind of work to each other using again one more cryptography layer. So with, even within these layers, there are, there are potentially a lot of policies that drive this entire beast out, okay? Um, you can call it as uh, a, a well-driven, um, see the advantage we have is we, we are starting from scratch, from zero all the way. So it, it, it gives us a huge advantage of using all the existing service oriented architectures that provides us with these abilities. So every single part gets a certificate, every single part can authenticate and prove that it is me who is authenticating with you and you can't have a rogue part authenticating even within our clusters, okay. Uh, to that extent it kind of, everything is digitally signed within these layers. Uh, all PAI, um, interestingly um, even the PAI encryption is policy driven within, within our case. So you could tell, uh, you could define in MOSEP this is what my identity system should look like. So we, in most of, we don't define and tell you that these are the attributes of the user that you could collect, but as a government or whoever is the adapters of MOSIP could define and tell these are the 10 information that I'm going to collect. What are those 10 information you could choose? Name, you should choose father's name, you could choose what you think your country's need is at that point in time or your organization's need is at that point in time. Choose that as your ID schema and we create that, uh, that if you, if you see LDAP, how, how we derived these things from LDAP, so we, we have done the same mechanism. So we have derived these things out of our experience and the, on the, on the work that we have done even before most of us started, right? Uh, so we, we created this. We have a basic schema that we give out of the box, right, from our system. But the kind of sovereign countries and their rules and the regulations and how the World Bank works with them all defines what their uh, ID system should look like, what information they should collect, and they could define it there. And once you define, you define the policy, and the system takes it. And by default, the policy is always everything is PAI. You until unless you override them. So that is the way it, it, it gets defined in these places. Okay. Um, there are a lot of third party interactions that we have built in. So what we have done is as, as we started this, foundational IDs are not something that you will run over uh, an internet and then Facebook would authenticate and, and uh, other, other companies would authenticate. That's not how the foundation ID would be used. Most often the foundation IDs are used to provide services to the end residents in the country, right? Uh, so we, and in that way, the ID system is not going to provide a service. The ID system is going to tell the service provider that, hey, you know what, this guy who said who he is, he's actually who he claims to be, and here is his information. You, now you can decide to provide the service. So that is how this is structured. So there are a lot of third parties that is going to interact with our solutions, and, and wherever we collect private information, which is your fingerprints or uh, your uh, BIDs or some information. On the other side, when the user is present, we ensure that the data is encrypted in a form that only we could decrypt. Everybody else in between could add layers about, but they really don't know what's inside it until the data reaches us, okay? 
and you could add anything as I said for your own service references and once it reaches us we provide you back the information then you can untangle the entire thing to decide you want to provide the service after that or not. Okay. Uh, we will we'll go a little more deeper as further more slides comes in. Um, okay. uh, I will move on. Um, so, there are a lot of trusted executions that we use, uh, TE is at the core of things. Um, so, we are going to collect biometrics in, 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 in a particular system. Uh, we allow both online way of collection and offline way of collection because a lot of countries are still offline in terms of going to uh, a village, uh, they wait there for like one week or two weeks, they sit there, bring in the uh, people out there, collect biometrics and information and then they go back uh, to a place where there is connectivity and then they kind of transfer this data. Um, so, in, in, in all the offlines, uh, we rely on uh, the TE as a trusted execution layer. Um, so, uh, a, a trusted execution layer is already authenticated back into our server and if we trust that particular system, that particular trusted execution layer, our keys are in there and then the data is encrypted in that form. So, it, it, it boils down to the hardware which defines it and in order to not create our own standards in those cases, we relied on TEE at this point in time. Uh, to provide it. So, whenever a, uh, whenever a registration client gets installed in a, in, a, in a particular machine, it needs an exchange of key and a pre-trust that is established when the laptop or when the device was actually bought into Mozilla. Do you mean a specific hardware like SGX or do you mean like a, like a VM or uh, hypervisor okay. or what do you mean by that? Yeah, at, at this point in time, um, it is a trusted execution certificate from Microsoft, the TE certificate that we use for secure boot. Okay. Uh, is what potentially is used as an authentication mechanism to prove that system was allowed. So, it's more like boot, boot. but you are not doing currently memory no. protection and so on. Uh, so, we do not have a secure enclave right now. Okay. Uh, the secure enclave codes are not in place. Uh, only the TE code is in, uh, in place right now. So, no enclaves at this point in time uh, in there. So, the, that no risk 5 no SGX, uh, but we are looking at it both for hardware and the software, uh, but there is no code right now. Um, in there to do the uh, SGX. Uh, this is at the enrollment client level where, where not biometric data is collected. The biometric data collected completely is driven into the hardware uh, to an extent where uh, we are working towards a common criteria certification for that, wherein uh, the, at the chip level there is a complete secure boot and their keys are pre-built into these chips to encrypt and then provide it all the way into the server. So, they easily sign and then encrypt and send it. Um, could, could you say a little bit about the role of kind of formal methods in this? I mean, do you have things like uh, specifications of the security properties or is there a sort of formal basis for the policy specification language? Do you expect to produce correctness proofs of the, of the code or the, the protocols or things like that? I mean, the, 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 these things are getting a lot easier, right? The tooling, the tool chain for formal specification verification is becoming kind of commonplace. And you can imagine in about five years' time, this is going to be, you know, an absolute sort of requirement for a lot of this kind of software. Is, 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 do you have plans for, or do you currently use formalisms to, to ensure this stuff is correct and works? Sure. So, uh, so certification is a uh, very important thing. As, as I said, we, we rely on some of the existing known certifications that are readily available in the market uh, to actually use it. In other cases, uh, we have put our own specifications out in terms of um, how you, how this particular device could be built for a MOSIP kind of an in, environment. If and and are these are actually formal specifications or are they informal specifications? I'm not able to get that question. So, is, formal sorry. specifications is what you meant? Yeah, are, are, are your specifications formal? As in, are they written down in a formal specification language? Oh, okay. uh, The kind of thing you could import into a theorem prover or are they the kind of the informal specifications we typically see with sort of, you know, internet standards, that kind of thing? Okay. So, yeah. Uh, as I said, we, we have not gone with a formal sort of, uh, uh, certification yet. What we have done is uh, potentially put out these standards in the open right now. Um, the uh, entire details of how these standards um, is adapted and what kind of things has to be used is put out. What we are working towards somewhere in the near future is to get to a common criteria thing in place. So that there is a standard, if you want to build a MOSIP compliant device, this is how you would build it. I'm, I'm not sure if I'm answering the question right for you. Yeah, I, I was thinking more about my kind of formal proofs. 
Um, Formal proofs that you need to bring in. Yeah, uh, yeah. I mean, that's becoming quite common now in security is, is formally proving the system is correct or it satisfies various properties that you want. Correct. Correct. Um, but anyway. Okay. Uh, so from from Mosip's point of view, uh, the formal proof, I don't think we we, we, we have anything at this point in time. Uh, other than that, we, we, yeah. Many people in the research community, in academia and industry in India who can actually help you do what, you don't need to have the skills. What Moti is saying is mm. that many people, including me, know how to do these proofs. Like Asim, sure. Asim can do these proofs, right? You, you all about that. There is an entire session. Just wait okay. and attend the next session, and we can collaborate with you and help you. That's all we are sure. saying. And, and what Moti is saying is that these tools, 15, 20 years ago, they used to work for small programs. Now they mm. work for big programs, and many, many people are building entire systems using that. Okay. So we can help you. That's okay. all. I think. So that's I, how I think that would, that would be, is saying. Yeah. That would also be brilliant for us, right? It kind of gives the trust. Good. I, I think I think that this is good. This is good. Okay. Uh, so the other uh, other important part of uh, the information is it, it's also about a lot of these governments or organizations also want to do a lot of analytics about the information. At the same time, uh, we want to be constrained about what amount of information can you take it and do analytics with. Okay. Uh, mostly about fraud and fraud analytics is what potentially it, it is all about. Otherwise, in a foundational ID system. What else could you potentially do from there? You, could, you, you should ideally be doing nothing more than fraud analytics. So uh, we, we aim towards fraud analytics and we provide uh, a decent amount of information that we think is appropriate in an anonymous way to actually perform fraud analytics. Um, the all other form of analytics, I, I think we are of the fact that you should not be doing it. So don't worry about it. It's your service industry, let the service industry handle that piece of uh, problems for you. Uh, that's how um, currently it, uh, it is structured. Quick time check. So I have ten more minutes. Um, so these are a little more internal details about, details about um, how we do things um, in in place. Uh, there are various trust levels over which we trust uh, uh, certain certain elements within our system. Um, our our TL one is is our internal application. So our trust levels there. Uh, is a certification authority that is built in inside the servers along as a part of the Kubernetes. So if you're part of the entire pod build and, and you're part of it digitally signed and you're starting it up, you automatically get these certificates. Uh, you don't need to do much, but it, it should have come through your entire build process in place. Uh, TL2 is potentially external facing applications and uh, TL3 is externally running applications or devices. So TL3 uh, is the trust level three um, don't confuse with trust level three is high or low. That's not what we meant. It's, it's about the layers where it, it goes. So it's not about the uh, which level is worth more trust. I have, all these levels are important for us to communicate. Okay, but the design that we adapt in each of these levels are different. That is potentially how it is classified at this point in time. So we think about three levels of interactions that we would do. One is within our own layers, which is at the TL one. Uh, one with the external third parties. It could be trusted bank providers, uh, trusted regulatory authorities who is potentially doing the service for the end resident, we want to communicate with them. So that is TL2. TL3 is potentially the devices in, in today's world. The, most of the TL3 design you will see it in the devices. So in a biometric world, okay, this, this is something that you can't change at this point in time. Maybe some point in time future will change, but this point in time you can't change it and there is a potential that this could be also be compromised. So what we have done is, as I said in the BAN, we made that to be revocable so that even this is compromised, that is not revocable. That doesn't mean we want to leave it open here. What we have done is we have specifically mandated a device for biometric, just like how FIDO and other compliances work. We also have mandated a specific device to collect biometrics. So if you're going to collect biometrics, it better adheres to the design principles that we have laid down and it is auditable and validatable. And that is why we are trying to get into common criteria to make that to be a globally wide available devices anywhere for biometric based authentications. So if you're going to transport biometric from one place to other, our designs could be used as a common design principles to adapt. So we made that as a specific standard and we have released the first version of that standard today about, but that's the first version of the standard. So we, we will also work three months from now. Um, we will also start working with the common criteria to see if we can put that out in the common criteria that companies could actually build devices about and do it. Right now we also have quite a lot of Indian companies which have built these devices, I mean not just Indian companies but the foreign companies as well, who have built and demoed these devices. These devices are going to be on the field probably uh, somewhere in this year end, they will start going on the field 
while the common criteria may be little later than that that it comes through. Are you concerned about attacks on these devices like in the supply chain? Is, yes. Is that, are there me mechanisms built in to protect? So, yeah. Um, okay. Um, I think we'll, we'll take it offline. Um, yeah. So, there, there are a lot of interesting things that we have done. Maybe there are a lot more to do, uh, but um, I'm, I'm willing to explain that uh, right after what, what is done at uh, that uh, layer. Okay. Um, we'll move on. Um, I'll skip through nothing much here. So, uh, we'll skip, skip through these things. Okay. One of the other interesting thing that we also trying to do as well as done to a certain extent is the fact that a lot of the countries that we work with um, also lacks people who can actually run a huge system like this which is tech technologically uh, and security wise is a very complex en environment. So, we have tried to automate as much as possible from certificate creation, root certificates to uh, mapping them to telling what kind of keys that they should be using, how often the keys has to be rotated to everything we are trying to do built into the, into, into the system as much as possible in an automated way that somebody who adapts these systems could at least know there is a base level that is set in there that you can't go below this at no matter what. Right? You, you could absolutely go aboard. You, you could build your own algorithms. You could, you could do that quantum leap that you think is necessary to, uh, for your country to adapt. You could absolutely do it, but you can't go below this level. You you need to be above this level, and that to the be to be this level, you don't need people in your country to come and actually advise. It, it's it's a completely open, available. Multiple countries are running the same models, so you're you're safe to adapt and start that first beginning. So there is no entry barrier that we create uh, in the name of security for people to adapt it. Okay. That was also an um, important one uh, to ensure we don't do that. Um, uh, quite a lot of other things, but I'll, I'll, I'll skip them. Um, okay. The, the, we, we spoke about uh, a concept of how we derive keys, how we encrypt data. So, we, we call this mechanism as a zero knowledge database, right? That's zero knowledge storage. The idea is the same model as ownership with this custodian, right? I am, the government or, or who are adapter of MOSIP is supposed to be treated as a custodian. You are a custodian, you could keep my information, but you know what, I don't want you to manipulate my information, I don't want you to look at my information until you, you speak to me or you have a consent from me. And we want to make that to be very obvious. We also want to be making obvious that just because you have the information in, in your own devices, in your servers, that doesn't mean my information is like readily available for you. And uh, at the same time, it's not an operational nightmare for the administrators to actually manage this database. If you look at a typical administrator's life, he would be doing regular replication, regular uh, backups, management of backups and other things. We don't want him to learn another new 10 technologies or adapt to some te 10 technologies to actually do it. So, we created a, created a design called zero knowledge storage. Um, it's a purely a cryptographic storage uh, system. It, it's nothing unique in, in nature. It would have been adapted in several design models several ways. We just named one. Okay, uh, it's just a naming convention, but the core idea is the person who's monitoring and using the system to make his regular everyday activity need not even know what's in there. There is no need for him to know what's in there. He's going to handle certain information in a certain way, which is well defined already, and pretty much everything is a text oriented. So, you are just handling certain text, and the text has no information that it can reveal about who you can never alter in either in vertical or in horizontal. When I say vertical or horizontal, it basically tells that the integrity of the system is in protected in such a way that the integrity is not at the whole data level. It's at every single record, every single column there is an integrity that is maintained for it. So, anywhere you change a, change a value or a swap a value, it won't work. The system would simply stop functioning and you need to go back to the previous data to actually start working. Um, and as I said, we are, we are working with Alan Turing for the, for the same mechanism that in case my data is compromised in that place, how do I get to transparently know that this is actually done, right? If I put that out, then as a resident, I know my data is getting compromised and I could take what legal action that the country and the regulation allows me to do in an appropriate way. And that has to be transparently communicated out. And we are trying to make all of those uh, things possible uh, within this entire system. So, you know, this is just a very high level uh, view that there are a lot more inside this, but I have not derived 
or dwell too much um, in there. Okay. Um, next is um, the device trust that we spoke about. Uh, I'll give a quick glance. I still have another four more minutes. Um, <coughs> so the trust is built in three layers. So we tell that there is a certain form of uh, secure boot that a specific chip is supposed to contain. Okay, and the boot should contain um, the basic operating system or whatever it, even if it is bare metal, uh, it's fine. It it needs to have a hash which is pre-built and approved by us, and and from then on. There is a root certificate that gets deployed along with that particular uh, chip during the manufacturing stage. So the chip also embeds a specific cryptographic library which is also approved. With these three things, the chip is, is chip gets into a certification stage. The chip gets certified, so it potentially has now a secure boot. It has a trusted mechanism and an enclave in there. Okay, it has all these three mechanisms. Uh, we also cover uh, the side channel attacks and other things to be part of that entire specification. Uh, so everything is covered similar to what a banking industry would do with the chip. So once you have this chip in place, now the device providers are brought in to tell that all the device providers should use some of these approved chips or any of these approved chips to build devices. They are not allowed to build their devices using any chips that are randomly out of the market. They need to use these chips. And when, when, this, when this entire thing communicates back into our servers, we, are, we will be able to validate the chip is approved by us. It runs the firmware that we speak about. Okay. Uh, we are able to validate the device in fact is approved for that specific design and model. And why do we do this? Because we want to make sure nobody could inject biometric into such a device. Because the device is going to digitally sign the biometric that we are going to do. So your biometric as it is, you take it from anywhere is invalid inside most of it. The biometric which is digitally signed by such a device becomes the only valid proof of authentication and, and that signature and the way that you could provide that biometric to that device is very important. So we are trying to tie down that path to a way where you could not inject it, inject that information directly into such a device or into our systems. So it has three level validations that happens at the chip. We know that this in fact is an approved chip. There is no known compromise for the chip. We could absolutely revoke every single individual chip from our server out of the way. We could do the same thing for the device level and then to the individual service providers through which that it tunnels them. Okay. The, uh, more details as I said, we can, we can address. Okay. Uh, I'll stop here. Um, I, I have a lot to go, but I'll stop here. Um, yeah. So, so um, it's an, as I said, uh, as Anadi said, it's, it's an open source project. Uh, you can look at us GitHub slash MOSIP, MOSIP. Uh, you'll see various layers out there. We are looking at um, contributors to come over and contribute uh, code, documentation, quality assessment, um, even look at it, review it and tell that, hey, you know what, you're not doing this here, you, you need to fix it. And whatever I said here um, is where we are moving down to. Uh, there are some places which we have not yet completed the code. As I said, it's a very young uh, project. It's, it's hardly a year now uh, that this project is in. But please uh, look, at, look at things. We are looking at volunteers' contributions, um, support in, in any form, in any nature. So, um, a couple of questions. Uh, some more people. Yeah. Um, we looked at the GitHub repo. Um, is there any place where we can get um, documentation, not the code, of course the code is available there, but documentation about the security design that you gave, described Good. at a high level, uh, and what kinds of guarantees you expect to have been implemented in this okay. code in terms of security and privacy. Okay. Um, I think the documentation is a little scattered. Uh, it is in mosip-docs, there is a repo called mosip-docs. You will see uh, some documentation there. Uh, but I don't think we have done a good job in, um, in, in, in taking that to a really a good shape. Uh, it's, it's in the books, but as you know, like, like any developer, the code, is, code comes first. The, the designs are usually in the presentations or some over mail communication, sometimes drawn picture, taken photograph and sent over Slack channels for us. So um, it is an aggressive development stage right now, uh, but I guess as that is a drawback. Um, if there are contributors who could help us, uh, make that even better. We will be more than be willing to uh, work with work with people to do that. Hello. Yeah. Uh, 
Yeah. Uh, so this uh, security architecture has three blocks: policy, services, and mechanism. Yeah. Right. If mechanism is weak, then policy and services, no right. sense. If you go to two, three back slides, you uh, return in random number that uh, true random number generator is cryptography secure random number generator. Am I correct? Yeah, TRNG is. Uh, so let me finish the question. Yeah. So, true and how you generate this true random number generator and use in the system, and second, this cryptography secure random number generator, which algorithm you recommend or use it? Okay, so this ra random that you you are seeing here. Uh, for the TRNG, we, we, we kind of uh, nail down on uh, any PCI approved chips uh, generating a um, derived uh, random number. That is where it is derived to for the device part. Um, in our servers itself, uh, there is hardly a random number. The only random number that we use right now is a blum blum shove. That is the only random number that is being uh, used. Remaining all is, is a derivative. When I, when, I, when I say random, I, as I was explaining in the previous as well, right? The token is placed where we kind of issue a random token, but it is a cryptographically derived out of attributes of the user and the information that point in time and other stuff. So randomness is a, is a little there, but uh, the uh, actual random is blum blum sharp at this point in time inside. Yes, uh, you are saying you are using blum blum sharp. That is, but that is very slow as I know. Correct. Yeah. So, so true random that you are saying they're using the chip. How can we true random then? Yeah. <laughs> See, it is a, it is a uh, it, it is to a certain extent derived. It's not a hundred percent uh, true, mm. but the properties is as I said. The property of TRNG is defined. Uh, within the scope of what a PCI domain today defines in a financial transaction is. And in that definition, it is as long as you could have a long lineage of numbers that you could create with the physical property that the chip provides in there with the noises that it provides, you are pretty good. Okay. okay. Uh, can the noise be reproduced? Absolutely. Uh, mm -hmm. How far is it good in reproducing? I think it is extremely tough to reproduce with the current known technology until you take this chip uniquely every chip and start actually doing a full x-ray X -ray scan and full 3D scan and then actually mimic that to a decent 90% model, right? Um, so to that extent, a TRNG still works with, with, with our environment like us right now. Uh, in terms of blum blum shop, we pre-generate a lot of these numbers and store them and then reference ID them when we need them. So that is how we keep up with the speed for that. So it's a pool of numbers that gets pre-generated for us. I know there are a couple more questions, but we're running out of time, so maybe should we take one last question and then wrap up? Yeah. Kapil Shriram, one of you. <laughs> so, uh, so at, at least in the cryptographic community, there's a lot of emphasis placed on crypto agility, right? The ability to move forward okay. with crypto algorithms. Is there a similar concern around biometrics? That is there a concern that maybe some government decides to use biometrics today that look fine, but in 10 years time might be weaker, might not be unique enough. Uh, and there's ne there need for agility to for the whole system to move to a new biometric. Is that is that something that you are worried so, about? Okay. Yeah. So regarding biometrics, uh, um, there are lots of concerns regarding biometrics. Uh, uh, uniqueness is just one of them. Uh, the way we see it is. Uh, Biometrics we don't really actually want to use in authentication. The what happened uh, in the last ten years is with the advent of this nice device uh, and and the proliferation of this authentication could only we want to use biometric for the deduplication, establishing uniqueness of identity. Once you have established uniqueness of identity, to whatever extent possible. Then we don't. Then we don't want to rely on biometrics anymore. There are other problems with biometrics. So it doesn't work for children. It doesn't work for very old people. Doesn't My work for hard had laborers. Problem, uh, she she couldn't get her pension because State Bank of India was asking for biometric authentication. So these sort of things we want to. These are the learnings that we have, and we are trying to incorporate that all into MOSIP. But much of that is at the program level. The at a in a purely academic sense. I, I don't think I'm even aware of any study like that, that, that you're asking about biometrics. Okay, I'm sure there are a lot more questions, but maybe because uh, I'm sure Anadi and uh, uh, Sai will be there available, Sasi will be there available uh, today, so I think we should continue. Uh, let's uh, give a good round of applause for them for their nice talk.